What went wrong for the frogs of TCU in 2023? How do they fix it in 2024? This is the Big 12 Watch. I'm your host, Josh Neighbors. Stephen Simcox joins us today. Thank you, Stephen, for joining the show. And uh, we're going to the non-bold teams, focusing on the big questions, because obviously their questions are coming a bit sooner than mm -hmm. everybody else's questions are. Uh, you know, bowl season now is we got well, it's actually coming up this Saturday. But these non-bowl schools already have questions to answer. And so for TCU, I guess the general question is this. And I was talking about, I was actually talking to somebody in my office today. They were saying, well, you know, five and seven's not not bad or not great, but you did go to a national championship game the previous season. So mm -hmm. is that the attitude of TCU fans? How is the fan base feeling? And uh, you know, which which is kind of the general sense right now for the Horn Frogs. I wouldn't say that's the general mood. I mean, I think there are there's definitely people that were super grateful for last year. And I do feel like Sonny walked into a situation with a lot of upperclassmen that had underachieved at that point, and he was able to unlock uh, a new level, and they caught some breaks, and they won a great run. This year sort of uh, on paper was like, okay, here's here's a year one in reality, right? Like this is what a year one looks like for a lot of coaches when they come into a new situation. You got young players. You're trying to um, fill some holes with the transfer portal new faces and they didn't they didn't compete well i mean there were concerning things to me about this season um i thought sunny was a great ceo and somebody who mm -hmm. kind of put a staff together well and could just let them do their jobs um joe gillespie really struggled in his second year they decided to move on from him kind of late in the process but they made a, a move quickly which i know we'll talk about that later and I thought Kendall Bryles wasn't super impressive in year one as an offensive coordinator. Now, they're going to give him another year to figure this out. But, I mean, honestly, Josh, like, Sonny's an offensive guy. So even if you're breaking into coordinator, if that's the identity of your football team, you would expect that that's going to be a unit that kind of leads the charge. That wasn't the case. They were really bad in the red zone. They turned the ball over a lot. Um, so, I mean, the question now is, okay, you showed that you can have a really good season and compete in the Big 12 and complete, compete nationally. Can you consistently do that, right? Like, can you build the roster the way you want it, construct it and uh, with players that you evaluate and be good on a year-to-year -year basis? Because one of the frustrating things about the year Patterson era, and it's funny, we were talking off-air about other teams around the conference, and Baylor's kind of gone through this too, where it's like the highs have been really high, and then there's, you know, a two and 10 or a three and nine sprinkled in there too. Yeah. TCU hasn't been that drastic, but this is their third five and seven season in four years. And I mean, bowl games have not been a guarantee and there just doesn't seem to be much of a middle ground. It's like top of the development cycle when you got a lot of juniors and seniors and everything's working well. Yeah. You can compete for a big 12 title. You can maybe get in the playoff and win a game. But the in-between years, you're fighting for bowl eligibility. And uh, I don't think it's ridiculous to expect a coach to at least feel a team that can go 7-5 and five or 8-4 and four on a year-to-year -year basis with the resources he has. But they're going to have to prove that now. And, um, you know, the, the vibes just weren't great all year long. So it, it, I think the, the pendulum swung much further to the other direction than people expected. And for the most part, I would say people still believe in Sonny and his vision, but um, it's definitely not the optimism they had coming into the season. Yeah, they lost a lot of close games this year too, right? I mean, they lost uh, yeah. the Colorado game as a one-score game. You know, you look back on that, and it's like TCU's better team. Now, and, and even in the moment too, TCU felt like the better team. Those red zone picks were just a combination yeah. of terrible They're decisions bad. with bad, with bad, obviously play calling too. And then you go to the West Virginia game, and there was like that. I mean, it felt like they didn't score for two hours in the second half, right? Yeah. Just couldn't move the ball at all. Then they have that game against Texas Tech where they had the ball at the end of the game, but like mistakes, some defensive stuff did them in. They couldn't run the ball that well in that game, which was strange. And then the Texas game, which like they were behind the eight ball most of the time. So these were games where like the way they lost was really just a hodgepodge 
I mean, it was a and there a couple mm-hmm. blowouts in there too, like a hodgepodge of how they lost. And you go back to the championship season or the championship season, the game they were, you know, they were in the championship game. Like they had close games, sure, against some lesser competition, but man, they they beat the brakes off Oklahoma and they looked like a much more talented team doing it too. The Texas game, they physically dominated Texas. I mention this all the time. They never like they they once the injury happened against K State, they were dominant in that game too. And then, you know, their loss to K-State was a really close game, lost by inches, right? I mean, really just yeah. inches in that game. And then you had the game against Michigan. They never trailed. And look, I know they got hammered by Georgia, but like this, you were so right. It felt like maybe Sonny struggles with having to do the hands-on thing. And with this group right now, he's going to have to be a bit more hands-on, or he's going to have to crush it with the kind of guys that he brings in the mm-hmm. portal, especially. So I think from an overall standpoint, like it's nice to see them be competitive, but I'm just, I was just underwhelmed with the results. And like the way they looked like they yeah. had these I mean, Savion Williams has got potential, but just didn't show up and they ran the ball really effectively at times. They couldn't do that. Like it's, you know, Josh Hoover takes over and it seems like the running game really struggled and mm-hmm. they're passing pretty well, but maybe was that because they were down in games, right? You know, that, is that a big part of it? Then the big Jared Wiley game, it's like, well, why don't we see more of this? And you know, mm-hmm. why couldn't we get the tight end more involved? There's just, they just never hit any kind of meaningful stride, right? They really never did. And um, I don't know if I can say for sure. Like, I think it'll get turned around. I think that program's got the resources. I think Sunny Dykes can do it, but like, mm-hmm. I can't say for sure that they will. I don't think anybody can say for sure it was just a blip on the radar. Yes. I mean, I feel like the maybe a good way to put it the worst, the biggest concern is they didn't have an identity this year. Like, yeah. at times early in the season, it looked like after the Houston and SMU games. I thought, okay, they want to run the ball with Monty Bailey. Like, that's what they do well. It's what when they're at their best. They run the ball with Bailey. You know, Chandler makes some throws. And they play decent defense, and they can win games. But then, as you said, like West Virginia and beyond, they had some injuries on the O-line, which didn't help. But suddenly, they just couldn't get any push. They couldn't block. And mm-hmm. I think that affected the play calling. And Hoover came in, and they started, started to air it out. You know, the one consistent thing in all those losses – was the turnovers. You had the turnovers against Colorado. Um, you know, against West Virginia couldn't score and, and turn the ball over a few times, gave them a short field. Against Texas, Hoover threw like one of the I mean, it was it was one decision. Yes. So I'm not gonna kill him for it. But he just yeah, threw like one of the duck. worst interceptions ever. <laughs> he threw a duck right before halftime and it was picked. And at the time it was like, okay, you're down 20 points at halftime instead of 13. Who cares? But then they end up coming back and they lose that game by one score. So in some ways, it was like, all right, uh, maybe maybe if you don't do that or if it plays out differently, you have a better chance. But um, I and I don't even really know what to make of of Josh. I think he did some things really well. I feel like he was put in a tough situation. But like yeah. both the Oklahoma game and the Texas game, things really started to turn, as you said, once they were down by three or four scores and to their credit, like they made, they made it a game and, you know, they got within a score of Texas a couple of times at a Oklahoma game, they cut it to 14 and at least gave the defense a chance to make a stop to make it interesting, which they couldn't do. But he, he thrived against bad competition and like BYU and Baylor, he had great nights. And then later in games when it was pretty obvious, all right, we got to throw, we got to hurry it up and move forward. So I feel like there's some building blocks with him, but I'm not sure that, like, I can't say defensively he's going to be a great quarterback going into next year. So there's a right. lot of questions that have to be answered. And I, I like what they've been doing so far early in the off season, but even now I don't, I, I can't really say what they're going to hang their hat on. Like Amani Bailey yeah. just declared for the draft. They're kind of trying to rework this O-line, but now you don't know who your running back's going to be. Um, is it going to be, airing the ball out with Josh Hoover. Maybe that's like, maybe that's the direction they go, but I don't have a great answer for you at the moment of what the, what the change is going to be on this team, at least on offense, on defense, they have a new coordinator, but at least offensively, that's going to uh, give this team more stability moving forward. Well, that, that brings it. You know, let's talk about the offense. So Josh Hoover is the big question here because we know at his core, Kendall Bryles wants to run the football. Like that's, that's, he wants to run. Yeah. Obviously he'll do some more air in and out. Right. Like Mm -hmm. this is the beer and shoot, but like they really do want to space and pace and they want to run the football. That's why it gets so frustrating when they throw around the goal line. Cause it's like, you all have been hammering the rock. Why is this changing? 
And I think for Hoover, the thing is like, you know, and some of the, like he made some mistakes in games they aired it out, but he's a really young guy. So yeah. that's totally fine. But we know he can air it out. And like he can make a lot of these throws. They ask him to do it. And and this is an offense that when you master, you can really do some th- I mean, we we've seen it a lot. Like when quarterbacks get comfort level with this offense, it can be really impressive. You know, concerns about the next level be damned. Like what you know, yeah. if you if you can master this Bryles offense, you're you can really do some damage. And um at quarterback, like it needs to be pretty consistent. And I know Hoover's not a big guy. He's not small, mm-hmm. tiny, but like, you know, six one, like less than 200 pounds, kind of slender. I'm interested to see what the plan is. Cause you know, there is a guy like KJ Jefferson. I've mentioned this too. He's out there, you know, he's not entered the portal yet, but Arkansas just got Taylor green. And so like, that is a guy that ran Kendall Bryles offense really effectively. Is that something that's being talked about? You mentioned Chandler Morris has not moved on yet. And so I think Hoover's a guy that I think will end up being good, but we've seen it now more and more in college football. And I I think TCU might be a situation where this happens too. You just had a season where you won, uh, you know, it was a 12 games, I guess. What was it? It ended up being 12 games, right? So, and you win five, like the heat to win is always the heat to win. And so maybe you don't invest the time in developing the quarterback. You want to get somebody else who's more proven. So, you know, I think I think Josh Hoover will end up being good, but I don't know if if Kendall Bryles will have the patience. I don't know if Sonny Dykes will have the patience to make sure to see that through if it is good or not, because that's just the way football is working now. It is. You know, they've quietly been really quiet on the portal front with QBs. Now, I, I think KJ Jefferson makes sense in a vacuum for sure. One thing about Kendall's offense and Hoover specifically, we didn't really see him run much in the games that he was in yes. this year. Um, and I don't know if that was, I mean, I think part of that was they, once Chandler went down, they didn't really have a backup, so you can't get your QB right. hurt. But I mean, Josh, like you think of the offenses that have been good under Kendall, like Baylor aside, but even those teams with Seth Russell and Bryce Petty, those guys could run a little bit, but more, more importantly, like Derek King, KJ Jefferson, mm-hmm. I mean, the QB pulling the ball and taking off is a huge part of what he wants to do. So maybe we see some of that, some more of that from Hoover. Um, you know, the, the only QB I've really seen them linked to so far is Matthew Sluka, who from Holy Cross is a really popular yeah. name in the portal for a lot of different schools. They do have a freshman Haas Haney coming in next season um, who is super talented and is, was an elite 11 finalist is probably going to win another state title here this week with Alito and the Texas high school football ranks, but you want to give him time to, to figure this out. So if I had to guess today, I would say Hoover's the guy. Um, but it is interesting to me that I haven't heard much on the quarterback front. And I don't know like what that means for Chandler Morris, if he wants to just kind of stick out the spring and see what the vibe is, what the lay of the land is, and then move on. Um, but Josh, I mean, like you can't – last year they, they sort of got away with it because Hoover ended up being better than people thought. But in today's world, like – you almost have to take a portal QB every cycle because you're you're going to have some attrition. There's injuries, and I mean, there's just so many of them out there that want opportunities. Uh, it's hard to find a good fit, but I just feel like it's almost malpractice if you're not at least, you know, trying Sniffing hard around. to get somebody in there. So on on the defensive front, Andy Avalos comes in because the one thing you say about the 2022 defense was. They were really good at making adjustments. They're very also very good at getting punched in the mouth a lot of the time too. Uh, that was a quality that. Now in some of the games they were fantastic. Like I think the the Michigan game plan they got hit with some stuff, but like they were really good for the most part. They did what they had to do in that game. Um, Texas game, just another really fantastic effort from that defense. So what are folks? And, and then the, you know obviously it was a lot, they had a lot of guys back. They had a lot of guys back from the defense, yeah. and they did not perform that well. So. Now you make the change to Andy Avalos. What are people expecting from uh, from Andy Avalos as he comes in to run the defense now? And once again, he was at Boise State. You know, pretty good name. And what are what are folks? Uh, you know, what, what can they? What do you think they're going to see? The biggest frustration with the end of the Joe Gillespie era was just his. I mean, he was very. Uh, he had a very strong belief in playing conservatively. <clears throat> not blitzing a lot, not bringing a ton of pressure. And, I mean, in theory, you want to stop explosive plays, 
kind of bow up in scoring territory. But I mean, the red zone roulette, as we call it. Yes, yes. They weren't doing that well, though, Josh. I mean, they were still that Oklahoma game, like Dylan Gabriel was just having all day and making big throws. Uh, even going back to the season opener with Shadur Sanders in Colorado, it felt like if the team had a competent quarterback with a good skill, guys, TCU didn't really have much of an answer, um, either with the pass rush or in the secondary. Now, Avalos is much more aggressive. I mean, he's going to have a lot more four and five down looks. Um, he brings blitzes. The funny thing is, like in some ways, they have the hybrid defenders that he would want. I still don't really know. Like they don't really have edge rushers, Josh. I was trying to think about that today on Locked On Horn Frogs. Um, I mean, they have defense like more prototypical defensive end types, but they don't really have like. Well, I mean, of course, nobody does have like a cave on Thibodeau, but they don't even have people that are in that mold. They're sort of that uh, body type. So I'm not sure what direction they're going to go. Maybe you have to go kind of portal heavy this year. Um, but I mean, I, I think the general consensus is, well, if we were playing conservatively and still giving up explosive plays anyway, at least, you know, if you're bringing some pressure and doing some more exotic things, changing coverage looks, maybe that can lead to some turnovers, but I was surprised. I, Sonny, uh, you know, he went the group of five route the first go around and Joe was really, really well respected in college football and had done a nice job in the American conference. I didn't know if he could go find somebody that was like a, a true defensive mind like this that would buy into on the other side. You know, I know I'm going to have to deal with a hurry up offense. That's going to put me in tough situations sometimes, but I think Gandhi Avalos is a good hire, uh, like good pedigree, great resume on paper. I think the one concern is that Boise state team <laughs> Seemed to kind of quit Yikes. on him as a, as a head coach. Oh, they they quit that team. That, that team went, basically went on strike and was like, "All right, we're back." Uh, and they went. <laughs> yeah. that's, I mean, they they fired him. And they still won a conference championship. Now that that also, to his credit, I will say, like he did put together a team that that was still able to do that. Yeah, so those were in his, his first guys, few seasons, but, they weren't bad, but right this, this last so, year was a disaster from a culture yes. standpoint, at least. Yes. Um. Yes, I mean, because the thing is, like, for me, Steve, like, I think about this conference changing next year. TCU is one of the schools that you look at because of, like, Gary built that thing up. And as soon as Sonny Dyke showed up, he was able to accomplish something really impressive. And and once, like, I hope this does not get lost. He still did all, all the things that they did. Like, the three Blue Blood programs they played, uh, well, the, they played four that year, right? The Out of the four Blue Bloods they played, Michigan, Georgia, Texas, Oklahoma. And, and, and mind you all, this is the same Texas team with, plus B. John Robinson, plus Roshan Johnson. Now, some of the other guys were a year younger, mm -hmm. um, but they beat that Texas team. They hammered a lot of the same guys on this Oklahoma team. Once again, year one, Brent Venables. And they beat what a lot of people thought was the second best team in the country in Michigan. They were three and one against those teams. So when you spin that forward, Steve, and you think about them in the new Big 12, this to me, because they are in DFW, because they are a private school that should have the resources, you know, they got a, they have a situation. I mean, Sonny took a real risk. Like they've got the capital to bring in a guy like a Kendall Bryles from an SEC school, right? They've got the ability to do that. Um, they should be good. Like this should be a program that is always one of the best in the Big 12. Down years can happen, sure but this should be one of the better programs in the big 12 every single season. They should be winning at least in my opinion, seven games in the new big 12 every single season. Um, not saying if you win six, you gotta be fired, but like, I think all that stuff considered, that's where they should be. Do you agree right. with that? Oh, I definitely agree with that. I mean, I was looking at the 2024 schedule uh, a couple days ago and I don't think there are some people that are like, Oh, this is going to be a cakewalk now. I don't believe that. I mean, you still got to play Utah like on the road at Kansas, et cetera. We, I'm not going to go through the whole list, but there's tough games. But they're, in theory, there's nobody in the league now that should just be significantly more talented than you. Like there's no Texas right. or Oklahoma that's going to have more blue chip players. Uh, and I think if you have a program that has good culture and talented guys, then you should be winning seven or eight games every year. And every few years you should be comp competing – for a Big 12 title. And I don't think that's an unfair expectation given what TCU has done. Uh, and, and that's the challenge now. you got to go execute it. But I don't see any reason why – I know everybody to a certain extent thinks this, 
but I don't see a reason as to why they should have five and seven seasons like this anymore, except for maybe the occasional, oh man, we got hit with the injury bug or right. some fluke quarterback goes happened. down. Yeah. Yeah. But by and large, yes, you should be winning between like seven and nine games every year. And if you're not doing that, then uh, either something's changed drastically in the landscape or, you know, you need to, you need to hire a new coach to be frank about it. All right, Stephen, where can folks find you and your work and all of its variety? Blacktown Horn Frogs is on YouTube. You can also find me on Twitter at Simcox Steven. Show us at Locked on TCU and subscribe to Neighborhood Watch as well. My friend Josh Neighbors. Oh, I put he Neighborhood Watch is on here. It's Big 12 Watch now. I didn't even, I did, I should have changed it. Look at me, still behind the times. Uh, Steven, we have Big 12 Watch. Yeah, Steven, appreciate you being on here and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, man.